The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to this live broadcast of our virtual meeting of the July 13th, 2021 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. This meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. For the record, my name is Madeline Sundberg and I serve as chair of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. I will now call this meeting to order and ask that the clerk call the roll. This may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Bjornberg. Present. Commissioner Booty. I'll come back to that. Uh, Commissioner Howard. Present. Johnson. Present. Mr. Nystrom. Present. Mr. Sampolt. Present. Mr. Stady. Here. Commissioner Struthers. Commissioner Sundberg. Present. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Here. And Commissioner Booty. Present, sorry about that. No worries, thank you, that's nine members present. Thank you, let the record reflect, we do have quorum. With that, we will proceed to our agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at lims.minneapolismn.gov. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We'll work from the agendas that are available online. I will go through the agenda and sort out what items will be continued to a future meeting, what items will be discussed, and what items will be put on the consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff and without further discussion. Item number four is 110 Bank Street. This is Ward 3, Certificate of Appropriateness. This item will be discussed. Item number five is 24th Street North, Ward 3, Certificate of Appropriateness. This item will be placed on consent unless someone wishes to speak in opposition to this or modify staff recommendations. Um, so I would like to check at this time, commissioners, is there anybody who wishes to pull item number five off of consent agenda? Or if there are any members of the public who called in um, who wish to uh, speak in opposition to or modify staff recommendations for item five. If you could press star six and let me know that you have called in on this item. Okay, don't see any at this time. Uh, item number six is 600 and 700 Second Street South Ward 3, Certificate of Appropriateness. This item will be discussed. So again, the proposed agenda is consent agenda will include item number five, 24th Street North. Uh, again, is there any opposition to staff recommendations for this item or any one from the public who wishes to speak in opposition to this item? If you could let me know. Don't see any. So this item will, will approve the consent agenda items in one motion at the start of the meeting. And then item number four, which is 110 Bank Street, and item number six, which is 600 and 700 Second Street South, will have staff presentation, public comment, commission discussion, and action. Commissioners, may I have a motion to approve the proposed agenda? So moved, Howard. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Is there a second? Bjornberg seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. 
Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Chair Sundberg. Aye. Yes and zero nays. Thank you. The agenda is approved and I think I need to say let the record reflect that Commissioner Struthers has joined us. Um, our next order of business will be to approve the minutes from our June 22nd, 2021 meeting. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved, Howard. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Is there a second? Nystrom seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Abstain. Commissioner Booty. Abstain. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Abstain. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Abstain. Chair Sundberg. Aye. That's six yeas and four abstentions. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting the public hearing in this virtual format. Uh, the process for the public hearing will be as follows. First, we'll act on the consent agenda that we just set. Once items on the consent agenda are approved, the commission is done with those items and applicants may contact planning staff tomorrow about next steps. After the consent agenda items are approved, we'll take each remaining agenda item in order. First, planning staff will present its report and commissioners may ask questions of the staff. Then we'll hear it from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, I will open the public hearing and we will invite public comment. Um, we'll take speakers in the order that they pre-registered if there are any. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. Um, we ask that after your name is called, you state your name and address for the record and then proceed to your comments. After we've completed the list of pre-registered speakers, we'll see if there are any other speakers in the queue who may have called in. In order to activate your microphone, you'll need to press star six on your phone and wait to hear the pre-recorded message before you begin speaking. So again, I'll take the list of pre-registered speakers in order, then open the floor to any other speakers who may be in the queue. Um, remember to state your name and address for the record before making your comments. And please keep your comments to the specific application that is before us today. After the public comments are complete, I will close the hearing. Commissioners will deliberate and act on the application before us. I will now open the public hearing on the consent agenda items. So again, this is item number five. 24th Street North Ward 3. Again, is there any opposition to staff recommendations for those items? If you could press star six, let me know if you called in to oppose item number five, which is the consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on the consent agenda items. May I have a motion to approve staff findings and recommendations for these items? Nystrom so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Is there a second? Johnson seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. 
Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Chair Sundberg. Aye. That's ten yeas and zero nays. Thank you. Um, the consent agenda, item number 524th Street North, Ward 3, is approved as recommended by staff on the agenda. The applicant may contact planning staff tomorrow about next steps. Our first discussion item tonight is item number 4. This is 110 Bank Street, Ward 3, Certificate of Appropriateness. The staff report will be presented by John Smalley. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is John Smoley, and I'm very pleased to be before you this evening to discuss a certificate of appropriateness to remodel the 28th floor rooftop terrace of La Rive, a condominium high rise at 110 Bank Street in the St. Anthony Falls Historic District. Next slide, please. La Rive is a high rise condominium building designed in the postmodern style of architecture. Constructed from 1981 to 1986, it was approved during the early stages of the Riverfront District's transition from industrial uses to mostly residential uses. Standing at 312 feet tall or 29 floors, La Rive is the tallest building in the Nicollet Island East Bank neighborhood, and its terraced south facade features panoramic views of downtown Minneapolis and the Mississippi River. Next slide, please. The subject building is a non-contributing resource in the St. Anthony Falls Historic District. It's located within the Hennepin and Central District character area of the St. Anthony Falls Historic District on the site of the former Minnesota Exposition Building depicted here. Next slide, please. The applicant's proposal is to remodel the 28th floor rooftop terrace. Staff has received no public comments on this proposal. The scope of work is essentially designed to correct waterproofing issues, address building code requirements, and make the space more tenant friendly. Next slide, please. In particular, the applicant proposes to replace decking, waterproofing, electrical conduit, planters, lighting, doors, the guardrail, chimney caps, and furniture, as well as add a pergola, wall mounted artwork, and a four foot high by five foot wide egress window. The applicant's scope of work meets all required certificate of appropriateness findings with one exception, and that is the setback of the pergola. So I'll focus my presentation on that particular issue. The St. Anthony Falls Historic District is historically significant for industrial uses, lumber milling and flour milling. Such uses did not historically have rooftop terraces, but that should preclude the activation or in this case, the ongoing use of rooftop amenities on non-contributing or even contributing resources provided the rooftop features cannot be seen from the public right of way. The applicant has, has provided line of sight studies which indicate that the proposed pergola will be visible from the public right of way. The St. Anthony Falls Historic District design guidelines require rooftop equipment on residential and commercial buildings be set back from the primary building facade by a minimum of one structural bay or 15 feet, whichever is greater. For that reason, staff is recommending the project be approved with this setback condition. I'm available for any questions you may have, and I know the applicant is present and would like to make a presentation. Thank you for the report. Commissioners, are there any questions for staff? I don't see any at this time. I will now open the public hearing for this item. It sounds like the applicant is here and would like to speak. I have two names on my list, uh, Sandra Rolf and John Pierce, both as the applicant. So I don't know who would like to start off as speaking, but if you could press star six on your phone, wait to hear the pre-recorded message to activate your microphone so we can hear you and then just state your name and address for the record. This is Sandra Rolf, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sandra. I am a landscape architect with O2 Design Landscape Architecture in Minneapolis. Um, and we have been working with the resident of this terrace um, in this design. 
Um, I'd like to speak to some of the existing conditions and proposed design um, to explain why the uh, roof terrace design has been laid out as it is. Um, do you have the slides to share? Yep, we can see them. Excellent. Okay, so slide number one is, is taking a look at the view. Of course, this is a beautiful view towards downtown Minneapolis um, from the 28th floor. Um, as John mentioned, most of the um, renovations are being done um, out of necessity. Uh, Rewaterproofing is necessary, and so all of the amenities that you currently see do need to be removed. Um, let's move to slide number two. Uh, this shows the current plan um, of the design with the pergola on the far west side. Um, the space has been divided into three rooms um, to make uh, the roof terrace much more comfortable uh, during the shoulder seasons of spring and fall. Um, I'd like to speak to the location of the pergola as we have it sited on the far west side of the terrace. This is in the direction of the prevailing winds. Um, and this, of course, is both for aesthetics um, as well as um, safety on the terrace. Um, the winds, as you can imagine, on the 28th floor um, can be extreme at times. Uh, the owner currently has some very, very heavy roof deck furniture, which often gets knocked over. So mitigating those winds, both there's an, an aesthetic reason as well as safety um, for those below, should anything come off the top of this terrace. Uh, let's move to slide number three. This is a, quite literally a bird's eye view into the space, and I, I think you can see how the location of that pergola really makes the whole space more usable, um, you know, from west to east uh, with the current sighting of that pergola. Uh, next slide, please. This is a view into the pergola space, um, highlighting some of the sort of more comfortable rooms that we're trying to create on the west side. Um, there are louvers on this pergola which are mechanically operated so they can be opened and closed on the side as well as the, the roof of this. Um, when it rains, the, um, the louvers will automatically close and rainwater is carried to a gutter system which carries water to the uh, roof deck below. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a view from the main door um, coming out of the, uh, the living room area of the unit. Um, looking across, uh, this is actually a pedestal paver system as well as pedestal turf and into the dining room beyond, which is sheltered by that pergola. And next slide. Um, in the slide deck, we did decide to include um, some of the plan drawings to, to sort of indicate the current location of the pergola as the location where the staff is suggesting it would be set back um, as far as it is tall. Um, in this case, the, the pergola height is 10 foot 2 inches, and the red dashed lines illustrate pretty much the only place um, that would be suitable um, for the staff recommendations. And I think, I think everyone can, can sort of see that this would have an adverse impact on the interior part of the condo unit. Um, the doors to that unit are on the far right hand side of the plan diagram, and this pergola would obviously shade and, and prevent light from getting into the interior space. So we wanted to present that this location would not be viable for, for the pergola at all. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this highlights the, um, the structure itself. Um, and I, I realize that the, the HPC guidelines refer to the location of rooftop equipment. And I, I kind of felt as though that the intent of, of that rooftop equipment was really speaking to mechanical equipment, which obviously doesn't have the aesthetics of this element that we're looking at um, in these pictures. It is a, a product by Landscape Forms, and we've selected a, a powder coated um, metal color that would be a complete match to the other metal features on the building, so that it would tie to the architecture of this postmodern building. Um, as John mentioned, this, this building itself is, is not historic. It's, it's you know, the postmodern design, and it was completed in 1986. And so the selection of this piece was very intentional to tie to the architecture as well as it could. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think these images um, really do highlight um, the location or lack of visibility of the, the terrace um, and the pergola itself um, from most of the vantage points around the building. Um, on the left hand side, you're seeing a bird's eye view um, and circled in red is the, the terrace that is being renovated. And the image on the uh, top right, location A, points to location A in the bird's eye on the left. Um, the terrace itself is actually not visible. You can't even see the railings um, that are currently existing on the edge of that terrace um, from the park 
um, right in, directly in front of the building. The only location um, close to the building where you would be able to see the pergola is in the lower right hand image. Um, this is at the intersection of Lord's Place and East Hennepin Avenue circled in red. Um, you would be able to see the pergola um, from this from the single vantage point. Something else I'd like to highlight in this image is the, um, the solariums that have also been added to the top of the building. Um, the design of the pergola and the materials that are used within it are really intended to work with those and, and, to, and to blend with those. Um, I believe there are four solariums that have been added to the top of this building since its initial construction. And next slide, please. These final images um, include an existing image on the left with the terrace circled once again. Um, the arrows are pointing to the visible um, solariums that have been added to the top of the building since its construction. And the image on the right is a, a photoshopped image showing the visual impact of the pergola. Um, and this view was taken from the Hennepin Avenue Bridge. Um, we certainly acknowledge that the pergola is, um, is visible from the public right of way in this location. However, we feel that architecturally it will tie and complement the building um, as it stands today. We'd really like to highlight that we, we don't think that this would have any adverse impact on the historic district itself. And we'd like to ask you to approve its current location so that we can maximize the benefit um, from the, the public or, or for the sake of the aesthetics of the terrace. And just one more slide at the very end of the presentation. Um, these are two images of other pergolas that have been added to rooftops um, that are clearly visible from the public right of way. Um, in some cases, they are made of wood. In other cases, they are made of metal. Um, and I think it highlights that you know, there are other pergolas and spaces, uh, rooftop terraces that have been developed very, very close to beloved historic places within the district and that they really have not had an adverse impact. And that is our presentation. I'm open to any questions anybody has. Thank you. Are there any questions for Sandra? Did John Pierce also want to speak as part of the applicant? That's okay. I believe that John called in as a backup to my presentation. I okay. Any problems calling in. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. I understand. Great. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, those are the only pre-registered speakers we have then. Um, so I would like to check um, again if there are any other speakers who may have called in about this item, item number 4110 Bank Street. Okay, doesn't appear so. Um, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and um, commissioners. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, um, especially on this question of the pergola and how it should be stepped back or not. Um, I guess looking at the application material and understanding um, our guidelines, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going back on the pergola, so I'd like to hear other people's thoughts. Uh, Commissioner Sandbolt. Hi. After looking at this, I, I I have to disagree with staff findings, and I, I think this is a unique condition. It's a non-contributing building, and the sheer height of it puts the pergola at a vantage point that I think impacts how it how it is visually apparent in the district. And so I've kind of outlined why I disagree with staff findings. And staff finding number one. My disagreement is I don't see that the proposed changes will affect the integrity of the historic district. Number two, this area is historically significant for industrial uses. And although those uses did not historically have rooftop terraces, those buildings were also not usually 39 stories tall. 
Um, so I think it's already kind of outside the realm of contributing to the historic character of the district. Um, number three, staff has reference to regulation that is focused on mechanical equipment. And I don't think that that really applies here because this is not mechanical equipment. Um, and then, and number four, like I said before, I think, you know, I understand that it would be visible from a distant van vantage point, but by the time you're that far away, I don't think that the visual appearance of it is something that would detract significantly from the integrity of the historic district. Um, so those are my thoughts uh, open to discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Sandvolt. Um, I was having similar lines of, of thought where because specifically the height of the building um, and that although it's not stepped back because normally we'd step stuff back at least one bay, one structural bay, um, that although this is at the edge of that terrace, in my mind, the way the building sort of pyramids upward, um, I, I, yeah, I guess I'm open also to the, to the idea that the pergola is okay. Commissioner Howard. I just wanted to thank Commissioner Sandbolt for putting uh, the findings together in such a nice, concise package because I, I concur uh, wholeheartedly. I, I truly appreciate Dr. Smalley's uh, condition that he wrote and I understand where it came from, but I think this speaks to our need to better, uh, to have better guidelines for non-contributing buildings. Um, and uh, I think Commissioner Sandbolt explained it just perfectly. So I, I concur with her. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, I'm wondering if we've if if somebody wants to make a motion or if there's anybody else who'd like to weigh in on this discussion. Um, this is Commissioner Johnson. I will admit I it, every I, I can't find where the chat feature is right now, but I <laughs> Uh, agree with uh, Commissioner Howard and Com Commissioner Sandbolt. And since nobody is speaking up uh, to add anything, I would be willing to um, make a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness um, to remodel the 28th floor rooftop terrace, um, but strike um, condition one from our agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Is there a second? I will second Commissioner Sandbolt. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll on the motion? Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandvolt. Aye. Commissioner Sadie. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Commissioner Sundberg. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Thank you, that motion passes. Um, our next item is item number six, 600 and 700 Second Street, South Ward 3. I am recusing myself on this item, so I'm gonna hand this over to Vice Chair Howard. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, our next item is number six, uh, 600 and 700 Second Street, South Ward 3. It's a certificate of appropriateness and the staff report is uh, presented by Dr. Smalley. Go right ahead. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is John Smoley and I'm pleased to brief you on another certificate of appropriateness. This one to install accessory structures, fences, signage, landscaping, pavers, lighting, and related features at 600 and 700 Second Street South in the St. Anthony Falls Historic District. Next slide, please. The subject properties are mid to high rise condominium buildings located mid block on the north side of 2nd Street South between Portland and Park Avenue South 
on the in the West Side Milling Area Complex of the Water Power District Character Area of the St. Anthony Falls Historic District. Stone Arch Lofts was constructed from 2000 to 2001 on the site of the former Anchor Flour Mill. The site was deemed contributing to the St. Anthony Falls Historic District in 1971 in that year's National Register of Historic Places nomination. But with the construction of the subject building, the property is treated as a non-contributing resource. The adjacent 1914 building at 700 Second Street South, historically known as the Washburn Crosby Company Utility Building, is a contributing resource in the St. Anthony Falls Historic District with some significant archeological remnants on the subject property line that is shared with the Mill City Museum. Next slide, please. The St. Anthony Falls Historic District, centered on the Falls of St. Anthony, represents Minneapolis's origins. Native Americans have been visiting the only major waterfall on the Upper Mississippi River for thousands of years, as this cataract gradually moved north to its current location. The falls attracted European American settlers intent on harnessing its industrial potential, first through sawmilling, then grain milling. The city of Minneapolis began serious redevelopment efforts in the 1980s, which has transformed the central riverfront from industrial to mostly residential uses. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes to install accessory, stru install accessory structures or portals, fences, landscaping, signage, pavers, lighting, and some related features. They also proposed to improve or this is designed to improve the appeal of residents common areas and better delineate these private amenities from adjacent public and institutional spaces in Mill Ruins Park and the Mill City Museum. The applicant has noted that there is considerable public um, access of this private property, which the joint the two condominium associate associations would like to limit for uh, a number of different reasons. Next slide, please. It's a distinct challenge to convert industrial areas to residential uses without losing the historic industrial character that's really essential to that district's history and to our community's history. O2 has done so, and staff is pleased to recommend approval of this application with conditions of approval in three notable areas. Prior to the issuance of building permits, uh, staff recommends that the project be conditioned so that plans are amended to note that the area of each proposed planting area and planter shall be reduced by at least 75% in keeping with the appearance of volunteer vegetation in industrial areas. The St. Anthony Falls Historic District in which these properties lie is again significant for industrial uses and such uses didn't historically have masses of vegetation, extensive masses of vegetation, apart from the riverbanks themselves where extensive vegetation has historically existed, though it's been very unplanned and volunteer in character. The St. Anthony Falls Historic District design guidelines recognize that, and they do permit vegetation, but they permit vegetation that's limited, unplanned, volunteer in character, and the guidelines encourage native plant species. The applicant does propose native vegetation but it is really too extensive to appear volunteer in character between buildings in an industrial area. And for this reason, staff recommends the proposal be conditioned to reduce the size of each planting area and planter by at least 75%. Next slide, please. Staff also recommends a condition of approval that the two proposed metal gates on either end of the breezeway between the two buildings be denied. The St. Anthony Falls Historic District Design Guidelines direct applicants to arrange tall building masses to allow views of the mills and to allow access through to the river. The proposed gates will obviously not facilitate access to the riverfront from 2nd Street South. And this is an important characteristic of this section of the historic district where remnants of historic milling infrastructure are most evident. As the West Side Milling Complex Design Guidelines on page 127 of the St. Anthony Falls Historic District Design Guidelines note, the highest concentration of milling related development exists here. Access to the water power canal was at a premium and that shaped the massing and locations of these buildings. Building widths were relatively narrow in order to promote access to the water for as many as possible. And for these reasons, staff recommends the project be conditioned to deny the proposed gates that you see before you. Next slide, please. Installing the two gates will hamper public access from West River Parkway 
to both on and off street parking facilities located on along 2nd Street South, which may actually increase unpermitted public parking in the private surface lot on the subject property and exacerbate the situation that the applicant is trying to improve. For this reason, staff also recommends the project be conditioned to permit some additional signage, in particular non illuminated wall mounted signage identifying the property as private yet offering to permit pedestrians to pass through to public parking facilities on 2nd Street South. And these signs we recommend would be subject to final approval by staff. Next slide, please. In terms of compliance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, the basket weave pattern in the proposed metal fencing and gates does not appear compatible in design with the industrial character of the most intact milling area within this historic district. For this reason, staff recommends the project be conditioned to require any approved gates or fencing utilize a similar pattern, uh, I'm sorry, a simpler pattern already approved by the Heritage Preservation Commission for use on these properties. And in the slide itself before you, you can see at least three types of fencing that have already been approved by the commission on these sites and deemed quite compatible with the industrial character of this area. Next slide, please. Staff finds the portals or accessory structures are really also not compatible with the character of this industrial area. They're not associated with any building's design. They're not based upon a historic precedent in this industrial area. It's true that narrower structures of this type are frequently employed at the entrances to parking garages, but that's really designed to identify vertical clearances. And these features are far more monumental and really akin to sculptures. These portals or accessory structures would also be highly visible from the heart of this historic district, uh, one of the city and states first, where substantial investments and planning efforts really warrant added care. The proposed structures would face a highly visible, visible public right of way on a lot where many masonry buildings were present during the period of significance. This is one of the most visible and viewed areas in any Minneapolis historic district. Thousands of pictures taken on the Stone Arch Bridge each year would easily capture these features in the background. For these reasons, staff recommends the project be conditioned to deny the proposed portals or accessory structures. Next slide, please. So those are the conditions of approval staff recommends be applied to the project to meet the Heritage Preservation Commission, or I'm sorry, Heritage Preservation Regulations Certificate of Appropriateness findings. I focused your attention on those areas, those areas where staff and the applicant disagree, but I have not discussed the numerous areas where the applicant has proposed or amended their proposal in ways that meet these standards and staff genuinely appreciates these efforts. It's been a genuine pleasure to work with the applicant Han Zong. In particular, the applicant has worked closely with the Minnesota Historical Society to propose a fence that will not damage adjacent archaeological resources, as detailed in the public comment letter submitted by the Mill City Museum that's in your staff report packet. The concrete wall that the applicant originally proposed for the eastern property line has been voluntarily redu reduced to a fence whose footings will disturb less ground and which may be positioned to ensure they avoid significant subsurface resources as those surface uh, subsurface resources are encountered if they are encountered during the construction process. The efforts the applicant has taken to address not only the heritage preservation regulations findings, but also residents concerns is very evident in the public comment that staff has received. The applicant has submitted letters of support from representatives of every property owner on this block. Those letters come from MSR Architecture, responsible for much historic rehabilitation work in the immediate area, from the National Landmark, National Historic Landmark Mill City Museum, whose archaeological resources may be impacted by the proposed fence on the eastern property line, as well as the Humboldt Lofts and North Star Lofts homeowners associations. One additional property owner living at 200 Park Avenue submitted a letter supporting the project as well. And we have some additional letters that were submitted since the publication of the staff report. Two, come, two additional letters of support uh, come from one, the Downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association and Thomas Meyer, one of the founders of MSR Architecture, which offices in the Mill City Museum building. You have those before you this evening. There is a second property owner from 200 Park Avenue who submitted a letter that actually opposes the proposed gates for reasons of access detailed in the letter. For these reasons, 
CPED recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings for the application proposed by O2 Design for the properties located at 600 and 700 Second Street South to uh, approve the certificate of appropriateness to install accessory structures, fences, signage, landscaping, pavers, lighting, and related features subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. I'm available for any questions you may have, and I know the applicant is on the line and would like to make a presentation as well. Thank you, John. Uh, before I open it up to questions from commissioners to staff, I understand Commissioner Pierenberg has uh, something to say. Yeah, I'm just going to add that I am um, uh, also recusing myself for this, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Uh, so, Commissioners, uh, questions for staff. Uh, Commissioner Struthers. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. My question has to do with the gates. And I didn't see anything in the staff report or hear anything today about the residents' concerns about safety and security. And I'm just wondering what uh, Dr. Smoley thinks about that. Madam Chair, Commissioner Struthers, that is a great question. It does, you know, staff feels that it kind of stretches the um, boundaries or the abilities of um, heritage preservation staff members and commissions to be able to address those issues. Um, I did talk about this with the applicants and brought up some, you know, crime prevention through environmental design aspects or, or um, elements that could help address some of the issues. Um, I feel the signage that we're, you know, recommending can help create some territorial demarcation to, you know, convince um, passers-by that this is in fact private property. It's not suitable for, you know, photographs, um, for, you know, sitting and relaxing, um, maybe having a snack as, as um, the applicant has indicated some people do, or more late night activities. Um, you know, I've encouraged them to consider talking to the police. I've noted that, you know, in the past we have allowed security cameras to be installed um, and those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the San Anthony Falls Historic District Design Guidelines are pretty specific in that um, access to the riverfront, especially in this portion of the historic district is really a priority. And so we had to balance that guideline with our ability as preservation staff members, you know, and commissioners, not as police officers, as well as the, you know, the concerns we heard from the residents and the, um, uh, you know, design proposal of the applicant to come up with the recommended condition of approval that you see before you this evening. I would note that we have included a, another condition of approval that um, tries to help ensure uh, any gates that get installed should you choose to um, strike that other condition of approval that would, you know, try to make those gates um, compatible, a bit more compatible with the historic, these two historic properties where um, three different gate or fence types are already in place. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson, you have a question for staff? I do. I guess what I'm struggling with, John, is how I, I think in the report and in your presentation, we keep saying that we want to provide access to the public through a private right of way. And I'm really struggling how that's within HPC's jurisdiction about how we can tell a, um, a condominium HOA that owns the land that they need to provide access for the public. Is it a, is it a need or is it a, a want or a desire? I guess is my question. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Johnson, that is a great question. It's an interesting aspect of the design guidelines themselves. Um, but it's one that is in you know, some guidelines that were approved less than 10 years ago um, in you know, close consultation with the St. Anthony Falls Heritage Board, the National you know, Park Service, MINRA, a wide, wide variety of property owners, preservation partners, um, and interested parties in the area. And that is the way the guideline reads. Um, you know, in some instances when there's, you know, uh, where there are private properties, but where 
significant public investment has occurred, say, uh, for example, over at the Guthrie Theater, um, several buildings away from these two, the city does have a better ability to regulate um, public access to those private properties um, due to the level of public financing that was involved. Um, I don't know the level of any, if there was any sort of public financing that brought about the, um, you know, initial connection from the river itself to Second Street South. But I would note, as I did in the staff report and in my presentation, that, you know, one of the reasons that the applicants note um, they have concerns about limiting or they, you know, desire, desire to limit public access to the site is that there is some unpermitted parking that's going on. And, you know, it is somewhat ironic that if um, gates are installed, it will prevent members of the public from accessing um, some really terrific, very large, you know, capacity uh, public parking facilities very, very close to this particular site, two garages, uh, public garages, very close to this particular site. And I would also note that the gates that are being proposed are just for the breezeway area. They are not for the sort of uh, parking area that's immediately adjacent to the river, um, which seem to be, you know, the, the focus of a lot of the concerns about public um, use of this private property. Um, so I will I will um, leave it at that, but you do raise a good point. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I definitely acknowledge um, that it is a long block um, without uh, um, public access, but I will say that even if the gate is not there, it's you still have to walk up steps and then down steps on the other side. So it's not, accessible, ADA accessible by any means. Um, but I guess we'll talk about that uh, shortly. Following up on Commissioner Johnson's questions, uh, John, you mentioned, was this passageway, it was never a street or an alley historically? Um, Madam Chair, not to my knowledge, it was the site of the anchor mill. And the you know 1971 National Register nomination recognizes that it doesn't describe, um, to my memory, it does not describe any sort of um, public alley that existed there. Um, the riverfront itself was highly industrialized, um, and I'm not I'm not aware of this ha having been historically used as an alley. Yeah, I I couldn't find anything either. Thanks for that. Uh, confirmation. I had one question for you, and I was that was the the landscape uh, percentage you had uh, recommended reducing that by at least seventy five percent. And I'm just curious where that came about. Is it just through the um, you know looking at what might look more volunteerish, or was there something in the um, guidelines that I missed that had to do with size or anything like that? Uh, Madam Chair, no, that was just a an estimate uh, staff's estimate of um, a way to meet that particular guideline that called for limited vegetation um, being more unplanned or volunteer in character. Um, sometimes trying to quantify the conditions of approval um, yet still you know allow the applicant to um, exercise some initiative in terms of how they meet those. Sometimes that's challenging. So having said that, if the commission would like to go higher or lower, staff sees no you know, um, point in the guidelines themselves that would um, that, that we would bring up and, and you know caution you to follow. It's my understanding by putting that percentage in, if, if they are to reduce it, that would allow it to be reviewed by staff without having to come back before us. So having a percentage is going to be what is going to, what would be most useful for staff review on that item. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for staff? I'm not seeing any, um, so I will now open the hearing, the open the public hearing for this item. And I understand the applicant is here and would like to speak. Um, so please press star six on your phone and wait to hear a recorded message to activate your microphone. Um, and uh, be sure to state your name and address for the record. And we have John Butler, Robert Pollad, and Han Zhang for applicants. 
So I'm not sure who would like to start. I'll start. Um, <clears throat> Uh, hello, everyone. My name is John Butler. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm at 600 South 2nd Street in Minneapolis. I'm a Stone Arch Lofts resident and a director at Stone Arch. Um, I hope that I can clarify some of the questions I'm going to ask. My wife and I have lived in the Mill District for 11 years, and we love it here. It's a privilege to live here. We and our neighbors know that this privilege brings responsibility. We have to be good stewards of the historic treasures just outside our door. Our relationship with this environment, however, is symbiotic. Our care and our being here helps preserve these surroundings through considerable investment. But the environment also has to be livable for us. It's important to know that these two buildings that we're talking about, Washburn and Stone Arch, are really one property. We have one HOA. We share many common elements. For example, the breezeway we're talking about between 2nd Street and the river is the roof of our garage. The breezeway and the extension of the parking lot looks public and it's crossed by many people, which is generally not a problem. In fact, it's great, but sometimes it is a problem. Be aware that there's no easement that requires us to provide access to the public, as was discussed. This is where our front doors are on the breezeway, set off the street. While we want visitors, we want visitors and neighbors in the community to enjoy the space and pass freely between 2nd Street and the river, there are problems at times, but this is late at night, early morning hours. We've had break-in attempts. Recently, a lockbox was broken with a sledgehammer. People party late at night in a space that looks like a public alley between buildings, despite signage we have already. This is just a few feet from where residents are trying to sleep. The surface parking lot too, which is connected more or less, is also subject to abuse. As you can imagine, with theft from cars and vandalism. Uh, you might be thinking that's life in the big city, but this is our home. Uh, we need it to be safe. <clears throat> we, want, we want the public and our neighbors and our visitors to use this passageway respectfully to appreciate and enjoy the historic dis uh, significance of this area. This is our home. We want to be able to control the space in the late night hours when necessary and present a clear message that there are people living here by demarcating the property as residential with design features that reduce crime. This is crime prevention through environmental design. Our project started two years ago. Our 20 plus year old parking lot is seriously in need of repair. The uneven breezeway pavers need to be replaced and it needs lighting. Uh, we want to actually make it more welcoming in parallel with River First project. The new Owami restaurant nearby that we're all anxiously awaiting creatively and artfully blends historic structures with new and it has extensive native plannings. The committee with eight residents was formed and met for two years with contributions and experience of O2 design. Our plan keeps these spaces open to the community, but demarcates our property. It's ecologically sound with plannings, better surface water management using permeable pavers. The breezeway gate we propose would be retracted to the wall most of the time and used when needed, generally at late at night in the early morning hours. We have broad support for this project. Our residents voted with a supermajority to make this a uh, considerable investment. We worked with the Mill City Museum to find a solution that we were both happy with. In fact, we thought it was an improvement on what we started with. The Downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association unanimously, unanimously supports our project. You want to preserve and protect the historic features of the Mill District. We want to also. We think the solution achieves a balance we seek between the preservation of structures from our amazing history, merging old and new, creating a safe, livable environment for our residents, and a welcoming experience for neighbors, visitors, and the community appreciating our rich history. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else from the applicant team would like to speak and press star six? Hello, this um, is Han from OS. Hi, Hello, do you want to go can first? you hear me? Yes, yes Han, please. I can hear you. Yeah, um, this is Han from O2 Design. I'm the landscape architect for the project. Um, I would like to put my presentation slide on the screen. Um, clerk, please help me on that. And uh, if Commissioner Howard, could you let me know if you see the uh, screen? 
It, it is up there now, Han. We're on a okay, slide thank one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The the slide number is on the upper right of the page for the clerk reference. So I would like to make a presentation, start with um, explaining the background and the, the design principle of the project. In the century, the urban context of the surrounding neighborhood and historical area has changed significantly. While the period of significance uh, of our historical district is from 1848 to 1941, the 80 years following that contains a significant period of change and is very much relevant to the preservation of today's historical integrity. It is the adaptive reuse and rehabilitation started in the late 1980s, bring life back to this historical area. And I want also to respond to Dr. Somali's some comment um, and the questions from uh, Commissioner Strasser's. Uh, so the North um, Stone Arch Loft is not a historical building, is a infill building. Um, totally developed from the scratch from the ground in 2000, uh, early 2000. And the Washburn Loft, uh, we recognize it is um, a utility building that's a historical story part of the mu uh, city museum um, complex. However, it's not a historically designated building. And the archaeological um, a resource uh, we have uh, explored and worked closely with the Mill City Museum. It's more attached to the Mill City Museum property, uh, not to the Washburn Loft property. Uh, the only concern is along the property line area. I would like to state this fact. And uh, the transformation, as you can see through the slide, slide is very uh, like day and night difference um, from the early 1991 to now 2020. The area has been uplifted from a formal urban blight into a thriving urban historical neighborhood with densely needed residential and commercial urban fabric, as well as well-preserved open space oriented toward the historical water power canal. Over the course of 30 years, years of adaptive reuse development, the project site has been outgrown by later commercial and recreational mixed use development. It has not lost the balance of historical expression with contemporary residential living, which we believe is the initial intent of the riverfront revitalization effort. There is a need to revisit the project through the lens of urban growth to ensure the balanced coexistence of historical characters and the current structures, visitors and inhabitants for the future growth of the district. And this is really the ultimate goal of our project. Uh, as stated by John, the project was conceived at the beginning of 2019. It is two and a half year continuous design effort with community input and collaboration. So all the points of security and safety is well thought through and has been collaborated extensively with the residents and the community, really the people uh, the project is trying to serve. And and uh, um, Dr. Smalley have stated that we get all the neighboring property support from the block. The DMNA, the Neighborhood Association had voted to support the project unanimously because they have seen that we have the same goal, which is to promote a safe and vibrant urban environment. So there are some key issues, uh, design elements, particularly mentioned in the staff finding. Um, I would like to discuss them uh, and ask the commissioners to reconsider, approve them as they are crucial part to achieve the ultimate design goal to balance the historical expression with the contemporary residential living. If we could go to slide two, please. 
first I want to talk about the gate. Um, the gate, the breezeway is a private property. The stone arch and washburn lofts are subject to a redevelopment agreement with the city of Minneapolis, signed on 1998, which provides for reasonable public access subject to reasonable security and other conditions. The agreement also provides for the uh, joint association to establish rules and regulations governing the operation of breezeway and parking lot, including but not limited to hours of public access and the installation of gate. And I believe the legal counsel and the board member, Jan Breyer, is here today with us and he can answer more questions regarding this development agreement. The owner have obligation to ensure safety for personnel on their private property. There are multiple incidents happened in the past that are a safety and liability concern for the owners, as has mentioned in John's previous statement. The association has tried all band aid measures and get ineffective results before reaching out to Auto Design for a holistic review and solution. When Auto Design was approached by the owner, the first thing we did is to conduct urban analysis and historical research. As you can see in the slide two, area analysis revealed that there are other public access as labeled by the yellow color uh, solid lines in the slide from the West River Parkway to the Second Street South. For example, the passage between the Guthrie Theater and the Mill City Museum is a public property owned by the city. And there are multiple passes uh, through the Gold Metal Park to connect to the riverfront. I think uh, Commissioner Johnson made a comment that the access through the breezeway really is now the ADA access accessible and the Gold Metal Park connection is public and ADA accessible. So those public corridors are less than a block away from the site and have more direct access to the public attractions. The two off-street parking facilities um, Dr. Somali had mentioned and the tourist destinations like the Mill Ruins Park and the Canal Riverfront Ruins. We believe the solution to enhance historical district experience really lays in better managed and enforced public access and well attended private access. The erection of the gate will reinforce the already exist public circulation flow by providing daytime access into the breezeway with flexibility to close at night. If we can go to slide three, please. Uh, Dr. Somali mentioned that we are intending to close off the breezeway and um, close off public access, which is not uh, accurate. The gate is only closed after hours at night, which is in alignment with Minneapolis public park hours, basically from dawn to dusk. Uh, for example, the Mill Ruin Parks directly across the West River Parkway has park hours from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. in undeveloped areas. The parks are closed at night because of public safety concerns and the people hanging around at night really is trespassing the property. So this is the same reason we would propose to close off the private breezeway and to request a private property staying 24 hours open it's inconsistent even with public open space ordinance. Um, we have studied extensively about the design district guidelines. We want to state that again, the view from the second street south to the water power canal is not identified as key view opportunity in the district design guidelines. Um, one can only guess probably because the district design guidelines recognize it is a private property 
and should be treated differently than a public corridor. That said, um, the client and the design team value the existing view through the private breezeway as a public amenity and preserve it to the maximum extent without impeding the ability to access control for public safety reason. As you can see through the rendering in this image, the proposed planters, lightings, um, paving enhancement in the breezeway will be the focal point of the street expression and the pedestrian experience. And the gate will blend in with the historical building facade, which is a good introduction to the next slide, please. Um, this slide, I want to talk about the fence and gate pattern. We understand the sensitivity of design in a historical district and go through great lengths to study the design guidelines and adhere to it to preserve the historical character of the neighborhood. The district design guidelines do not provide guidance on fence or gate style. Reading the guidelines closely related to the fence and gate design, a simple metal work is most appropriate on industrial buildings. And also a contemporary interpretation of traditional design is appropriate for architectural characters and details. Uh, on slide four, um, if the commissioner can see this slide, the design guidelines does not explicitly mention that a basket wave pattern is not appropriate or even forbidden, which is very much understandable as the goal of the design guideline is to guide, not restrict creative design. And we believe this public hearing in front of EU commissioners is the due process for the design to get reviewed and determined for its appropriateness. So I would like to further explain how this pattern is related to the building and the historical period. As demonstrated in this slide four, the fence and gate is an artistic interpretation that combines the building existing fenestration grid with the historical basket wave pattern. The basket wave pattern originates from textile weaving and is widely used as brick pattern, tile pattern, and metal grid pattern on buildings and ground landscaping, interior and exterior. Although the basket wave pattern is not particular to our period of industrial significance, it is a historical pattern well established and has a rich architectural history, particularly on masonry work, which are prominent in our district's period of significance. And uh, I see Dr. Somali have presented the existing fence styles between the Washburn lofts and the Stone Arch lofts. Um, one reason we are trying to create a this basket wave pattern is trying to get inspiration from both lofts building and use this new pattern to unify and reconcile the different characters of the two buildings because we are designing for the common space of the both building lofts. So we and the client have a high have hold themselves um, to a high standard of design. So would think um, simply utilizing a pattern from either loft won't accomplish the high design standard the client set forth for themselves. And we have also studied other architectural patterns throughout the district, as it's shown on the bottom, bottom right of the slide. Those creative contemporary interpretation when done thoughtfully, contribute to the historical character of the district. Um, I would also like to note that our fence and the gate have a much smaller street presence than the large scale building fenestration pattern you see uh, through the neighborhood example, 
which led us to believe that the pattern could fit in with the streetscape very well. Go to slide five, please. Talking about the portals. Um, so there are four portals in the project. One at each entrance of the parking lot and the one on either end of the breezeway paired with the gate. The four portals work together to establish a consistent property demarcation language. The portal is a freestanding open metal frame collided with metal panels. It highlights the entrance point without blocking the access or interrupting the view. Uh, as Dr. Somali mentioned um, about crime prevention through environmental design, we think the portal speak well to that. We are really highlighting the entrance of our, our property without uh, harsh blocking the entrance. The portal's function is very similar to traditional building canopy and awning, which are encouraged by the district design guidelines. It is also an artistic interpretation of industrial roofscape historically present in this area. The design guideline acknowledges the struggle of accommodating human use in an industrial um, significant area. However, it also provides us the tool to combat this challenge by properly utilizing horizontal articulation techniques, such as canopies and awnings. The portal is a freestanding structure. The purpose is to avoid major alteration on building facade and structures, but it functions as a part of the architectural feature to convey a sense of human scale at street level. Similar types of creative use of various metal canopies, porticos, and awnings are throughout the district. As you can see in this slide, for example, at A Mill, across the street from the river, uh, sorry, across the river from our property, a metal portal canopy was added to the building front to highlight the entrance in otherwise homogeneous building facade. Our neighbor North Star Lofts has a long portico to call attention to the entrance at the street and lead the visitors to the building front door. The metal canopy in front of the Washburn Lofts and the Mill City Museum is not original. As you can see on the upper right, photo is a historical photo in, uh, from early 2000. Those metal canopies added to the character of the historical building tremendously. Um, Dr. Smalley also commented on the scale of the portal. The portals at the parking lot entrance must accommodate emergency vehicle access and trash collection vehicle to get through the parking lot which makes it necessary to be the proposed height. The portal at the breezeway is way much um, shorter than the ones in the parking lot. However, it is proportional to the first floor height of industrial buildings in the district, as well as the existing metal canopy in front of Washburn Loft and Mill City Museum. Those scales are designed intentionally to relate back to the architectural features and the historical building characters. Go to slide six, please. We have conducted a study of existing and proposed street view comparison, particularly about the, the sort, uh, so, excuse me, the photo opportunities at the iconic landmark of the Mill City Museum, as we value and treasure Mill City Museum as everyone. As you can see through this study, the portals at the parking lot fit well into the surrounding environment. The portal canopy is at the tree canopy level, blend in with the added plantings of trees and other vegetations. It established the continuity of human scale along West River Parkway, 
enhancing the visual experience around the historical district. And if we go, could go to slide seven, please. The next several slides illustrate our proposed design renderings at the top of the page in comparison with existing site photos on the bottom. If the clerk could help uh, slowly flip through them as I speak for the next one minute, um, maybe flip back, flip back and forth slowly. They are organized by five spatial areas. The second street, south street scape enhancement, private breezeway repair and enhancement, parking lot repair, private garden restoration, and the last property demarcation. I really hope the design speaks for itself as how it is great improvement in public environment. Several notes regarding the request of planting reduction in keeping the appearance of volunteer vegetation in industrial areas. First, the design guidelines use the word volunteer to describe the locations and character, not mentioning the quantity. Second, the description is only referring to historical relationship with the landscape. The design guideline particularly state that on page 43, if um, people have the, that guideline in front of them, it says vegetation is key element of the evolving adaptive reuse of land, landscape. The intent is to introduce and promote vegetation in the district in a manner that accentuates and interprets various historic function and the context of the district. The increased landscape area concentrates on the adaptive reuse functional area inside the private property, including greening the second street front, establish the private breezeway as a welcoming common front entrance and promoting stormwater management and a greener parking lot. So planting inside one mill ruin area at the property, we recognize it have historical value and it should be um, remain volunteer appearance. So that area will remain untouched in this project. Enhancing those adaptive reuse functional area with planting will provide a high quality physical environment, which is set up as one of the major goals for the city 2040 plan. As a landscape architect myself, I have closely followed the initiative from the city, the park board and other non-profit organizations to invest in the riverfront and landscape design for riverfront recreational use. Some recent projects, including the Waterworks Park just opened, the rehabilitation and the alteration of Father Hennepin Bluff Park. For this project, the, the client, the joint association is willingly to invest their private money to provide benefit to the whole historical district I think this is a, shows a huge commitment of our client to the downtown Minneapolis and to put their trust really in our city and in our neighborhood. We propose our project like this other major riverfront recreational landscape projects. will extenuate the historical context of the district in a private open space. To conclude, I would like to quote one sentence from the district design guidelines, which I think summarize the spirit of the guidelines and the mission of heritage preservation in guiding urban development. Just like many of the buildings of the district that have been adaptively reused to accommodate the evolving use of the district, 
so must the landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Han. I think we still need to get your uh, address for the record. Uh, sorry about that. I'm oh, at okay. 115. <laughs> I'm at 115 Washington Avenue North. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is there anyone else from the applicants team that would like to speak? Yes, uh, this is Bob Folag. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Bob. Um, yeah, and I, I do want to speak, but uh, you know, we've said a lot and we've taken a lot of your time. And so, uh, you know, the bad thing about being third is that everybody uh, before me has made the relevant points and they have, and they've made them well. And I, and I certainly support those. I, I just want to highlight uh, uh, of the thing, all the things that have said, you know, uh, you know, for me in terms of when Becky, my wife Becky and I, uh, moved down here uh, about five years ago from Edina. It was, you know, for the beauty of the area, for the energy of the area, the vibrancy of the area, which I'm right now looking down on the Stone Arch Bridge at. And, um, you know, we, we don't want to do anything to, to, to uh, you know, damage that in any way. But the other issue certainly is that we have known here uh, by, by living here is the safety issue. And um, unfortunately, it, it, it's a bit more of an issue than it was, uh, you know, some years ago. And we're trying to address that. As John said, it is our front door and it is private property. And uh, this is the way that we think best to, to address that. We understand that uh, in doing that, uh, at certain, certain, for certain hours of the night in this case, access will be restricted, uh, you know, that, that people otherwise have. But if you do look as, as Han pointed out uh, at the, uh, the different accesses that, uh, that already exist and remain as well as uh, now that the waterworks is, is complete, the access there that we think it's a, it's a pretty reasonable trade off in the whole thing. So those are the points I make. We ask for your, you know, your, uh, your help in this and uh, thank you for your time. And by the way, I live at 700. So I'm in Washburn, I live at 700 South Second. Thank you. I was just going to ask that. Uh, commissioners, are there any questions for the applicant? I had just one. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, extensive uh, information that you, you presented before us today. I want to go back to that basket weave pattern. Uh, you mentioned that it was to help <laughs> unify the patterns on the two adjacent buildings. I'm just curious, um, can you confirm there, are there any basket weave patterns within the district that you found that would serve as precedents? I understand it's a, a historically appropriate pattern for certain districts, but are there any within this historic district? Can you hear me? This is Han. I can hear you now, Han. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I may accidentally muted myself. That's okay. Uh, by trying to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, about the basket wave pattern. Yeah. Um, the particular pattern is not present in the historical diary. Um, but I think as part of the creative design, we are already always trying to create a pattern that uh, addressing the issues that is a tasteful design. <coughs> uh, the If we can still have my presentation on slide four. So it's interesting kind of uh, artistic s stimulation. When I look at the building fenestrations of both Stone Arch Loft and Washburn, uh, Washburn Loft, so there are this kind of um, window grids and it function as the particles in a rectangular opening. Sorry, I'm not an architect. I'm kind of very intuitively talk about graphics. Um, and um, this, this grid pattern present in both of the buildings. So we are using the grid to unite those two buildings um, pattern. And the basket wave is really infill into the 
grid, uh, we choose the basket wave pattern because it has a significant significance about the masonry building. Um, and the masonry building is what those two loft building material. Thank you very much, Han. Uh, commissioners, one last call for any questions for the applicant. I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you. I, we'll move on to um, other people who have um, signed in for the public hearing. Um, we will take the list of pre registered <coughs> speakers in order and then we'll open the floor to any other speakers who may be in queue. Uh, we ask that each speaker provide your name and address before making your comments. Uh, when recognized, please press star stick on six on your phone and wait to hear a recorded message to activate your microphone so that we can hear you. Um, I want to mention that since we have a, a list of speakers here, um, I'm going to I'll limit your uh, speaking to just two minutes. So I'd ask you to uh, speak to the application before us. Um, and the first person on the list after the applicant team is Julie Snow. Julie Snow, if you could press star six and wait for the recorded message and then give us your name and address. Uh, great, perhaps you can hear me now. I can hear you now, thank you. Perfect. Uh, this is Julie Snow. Um, I am with Snow Carlic Architects and we're at 219 uh, North 2nd Street. And I uh, want to speak in favor of this design. Uh, I find it a very compelling design. Uh, and I would say that uh, I think we really have to be sensitive to uh, the security and livability of our downtown area, uh, particularly with uh, the recent issues that have uh, occurred uh, all over the city, really. Um, I would also say that, um, and I'll, I'll be super brief, uh, that I think the, the fence is is really a very compelling piece. I, I love the transparency of it and the way that it works with the brick. Uh, so I, I love, even if it's closed, you can see uh, down to the river. And um, I, we, we began work uh, many, many years ago in this district with the Humboldt Lost. And I will say that there was a, a really huge area of volunteer plants over there. So I, I would argue that volunteer plants aren't necessarily in small areas, uh, but might be in, in quite large areas as well. So I, I really think that the planted areas uh, lend a wonderful uh, sort of humane scale to the street. Uh, so. Great, thank you for consideration, bye. Thank you, Julie. Um, the next person on our uh, list is Jose Paris. Uh, if you could press star six and give us your name and address before <clears throat> speaking. Jose? Hi. We can hear you, Jose. Hello? Hi. This is very, thank you for the call. I think John and Bob Pollard and the architect have said things very, very well. We think this is a lovely um, design. We currently, I have to say honestly, we cannot sleep at, at, at night when the noise is going on. In the morning around 6 a.m. we often go out and we take the dog out and we have found beer cans, cigarette butts, needles, garbage on the stairs and in the breezeway. We have seen people peeing against our building. Uh, even today, when I went out to take the dog at six o'clock in the morning, I saw beer cans. We have removed graffiti from our building. As you pointed out, um, you know, this is a private area. The police no longer have the resources to respond to the calls as they used to. They told us that this neighborhood used to be, to be industrial. It's now residential. We think this will enhance the beauty of the neighborhood. We, we think there is a lot of attractive work, so we implore you to help us uh, to retain a sense of safety and to make this um, local downtown Minneapolis a place to come home with, uh, as opposed to a lot of friends who ask me, why do you live still there? Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Jose. We appreciate your comments. Uh, the next person on the list is Diana Golden. Diana, if you could press star six and then give us your name and address after the recording.
Diana, are you still on the line? Okay, I'm gonna skip past Diana. We'll come back to her. Uh, the last person that has pre-registered is Jan Breyer. If you could press star six and give us your name and address. Jan Breyer. Jan, are you on the line? Star six. I see Jan was just readmitted to the, the meeting. Jan Breyer, we're up to you on the, the list. Uh, if you could press star six and tell us your name and address. Jan, can you hear us? Perhaps I could. Uh, <laughs> Jan, it says that you are unmuted. Can you hear us? Jan. Jan, one last chance. Uh, can you speak? Can you hear us? Yeah, let's go. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Diana Golden. One last chance for Diana Golden. Are you on the line? Please press star six. Okay. Should we try Jan one more time? Jan Breyer. Did you have comments to make? Press star six. Okay, I'm going to move on. Are there any other people in the public queue that would like to speak for or against this application? If so, please press star six and wait for the recording. Seeing none, I'm going to close this public hearing. Uh, commissioners, let's discuss. Are there any uh, concerns or comments uh, based on what you've read and what you heard tonight? Who would like to start the conversation? Commissioner Howard, I don't mind starting. Okay, thank you. I was beginning to wonder if anybody could hear me. <laughs> we'll do the first round. Um, no, I, I appreciate um, the uh, long presentation from the applicant and John's um, uh, presentation also. Um, you know, I, I'm i kind of going back and forth on this because I know this is uh, an iconic building. It's um, very visible from the stone arch. It's one of the, it's like the, the 
the the picture of Minneapolis if you're uh, looking at the skyline from the stone arch. Um, but I also understand the residents' concerns. I um, also live in this neighborhood, so um, I can, you know, kind of understand that it doesn't have the vibe of an industrial neighborhood anymore, but it is residential. Um, I have a really hard time telling um, the applicant that we need to, you know, that we're preferring concrete over and a non-permeable surface over, you know, vegetation. I just, you know, I am a big proponent of green spaces, um, you know, and even though this is like designated designated as a industrial area, um, you know, that I I I have just have a really hard time keeping it all gray and and brick um, when there's. Um, you know, an option to put vegetation on the table, especially one right up the street uh, with the waterworks projects, which is, you know, heavily um, reliant on vegetation. Um, I also uh, am really struggling with this gate issue. Um, you know, to me, it's a public, or not a public uh, right away. It's it's private. Um, I, I understand that 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 it is a long block. I, I can actually see it from my, I'm actually looking at it from my apartment. It is a long block, um, but it's, that alley is not ADA accessible. It discharges, it would discharge people into a private parking lot. And then even beyond the parking lot, there's not an intersection or a crosswalk for people to safely cross. They would be better, I believe, directed to um, the next street up or crossing at Chicago where the ramps are located. So um, you know, I'm really struggling with that and I'm wondering if there's maybe some area for compromise with the gate if we, you know, if allow the gate, but change the gate to make it more aesthetically pleasing and, and, and fit with the neighborhood or, or with that block. Um, you know, I would be open to to hearing about that, but those are really the two sticking points that I'm kind of struggling with with the staff recommendation. So, but I'd like to hear what other uh, commissioners what their thoughts are too. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. And while I wait for others to uh, gain their uh, desire to speak, I I, I I am struggling with the same uh, things that you are. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with staff on the the portals. I don't feel like those are in keeping with the district, but the the gate I think is. Um, uh, for the reasons you've already explained is something that is possible. Uh, I specifically asked about the basket weave because I just don't, I don't see basket weave in our district. I don't see it in that district. And I, I'm a, I, I don't feel like the basket weave pattern is appropriate. Um, and I would be curious to know how commissioners feel about the landscaping. Um, I was especially concerned about the, the landscaping that's actually within the, the breezeway and then along second um, to me, those looked like designed landscapes more so than volunteer. I wasn't as concerned about the landscaping back by the parking lot. Um, Commissioner Nystrom, you have some thoughts? I was just going to kind of agree with you guys. Um, you both said um, things that I very much so agree with. I am having a hard time saying no to some type of gate um, to the residents there as well. Um, I also feel that some type of green space um, is helpful in like a residential area. So um, I understand kind of cutting it down though, as you were saying, um, Vice Chair Howard, in terms of it not looking like volunteer. Um, but I, I agree also with the portals. I, I'm not a fan of those big portals that kind of, as you're walking and across Stone Arch, as Commissioner Johnson was saying, you see those buildings and I feel like those would be just very, very visible and kind of break up kind of the historic feel of that area. So I don't agree with the portals, but I, I am leaning more towards wanting to figure out a way to make the gate and some type of um, vegetation work, so. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. I just want to mention, um, Dr. Smalley did mention that there were, there were two different uh, conditions related to the fencing, one that would allow um, uh, the staff to work on fencing design. And I believe that that was condition six. So if we were to strike, um, you know, the idea of denying fencing entirely, um, that is still in there. Um, any other commissioners have thoughts on this? And I did, 
especially be interested in your thoughts on the, the vegetation and if there's a way that we can uh, look at that condition. Uh, Dr. Smalley seemed to suggest that uh, we could, we could uh, adjust that a little bit. Uh, Commissioner Sandbolt. Hi, thanks Commissioner Howard. Um, yeah, I am struggling with some of the same things that I think a lot of people are, but I, I think John Smalley did a wonderful job of putting together some really good, um, um, some, some really good conditions and some really good language here that gives us some pretty easy options. Um, I, I sincerely believe that the guidelines were intended to create permeability and ease to get pedestrians through this area. And I believe that that's a really important part of the of the neighborhood. At the same time, I understand the need for a gate to create some security in the evening hours. And I believe that it, that's a reasonable expectation um, to be able to do as part of a private property. And I know that we can't dictate the open hours of, the, of that gate. I wish we really could. Um, I know it's been said that it would be open during the day so that um, daytime traffic can go through. And I really hope that if we approve this gate that you would stick to that um, promise um, because I, th I think it is really important to the neighborhood. And I believe that the designs that you've proposed are really a good design solution to making it feel more private and to making it fear, feel um, less like a place that you want to um, invade and in some place that's uh, that's residential in nature. So I would agree with um, most of the the conditions that um, uh, that John has laid out for us here. I think I think I'm on board with striking number four and then going ahead with the number six instead to to have the gates match. I also think because there are so many gate styles in the neighborhood, this would help be in keeping with one with with what's already there. And I think that would be helpful to make the uh, district feel a little more co um, cohesive. Um, as far as the area of planting, I, I do think that 75% is a little aggressive, but I would say I'd, I'd feel comfortable with something like a reduction of 25 to 50%. Uh, so I would like to hear other commissioners' thoughts on that. I'm I'm kind of leaning to a reduction of about 25%. Um, just that, just kind of take it back a little bit from where where they've shown it. Um, but would love to hear other commissioners' thoughts on on that percentage, especially. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Other uh, thoughts from the commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Booty. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Um, yeah, I was going to. Um, I'll first speak to the the vegetation. Um, so I did. I didn't necessarily have a big issue with um, the vegetation as planned, um, which um, I just wanted to uh, support uh, Commissioner Sandbolt's twenty five percent reduction. Um, and my only reason for that is that uh, in your point, Commissioner Howard, of the um, the uh, Second Street side um, not necessarily appearing as voluntary um, as the rest of it, um, and maybe that gives them some more freedom to to um, make those changes. Because I'm also not sure I'm familiar with not as familiar with the rest of the block, but I don't know how much vegetation is on that side of the block as well in the rest of the district. So. Um, and then in terms of the the gate and the portals, um, I uh, would um, also support uh, striking the, um, I believe number four um, and going with the number six um, uh, with uh, in terms of uh, providing some safety for them in terms of their public property. There's no pri uh, public easement or anything. And I, while I, I hesitate to limit it, limit that um, access. Um, I also understand that their their application. Thank you very much, Commissioner Booty. Any other commissioners or uh, would someone like to propose a motion? Okay. 
Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Commissioner Sandbold. Hi, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the certificate of appropriateness as listed in the agenda with all of the conditions listed except for condition number four. I would like to strike number four and then I would revise number three to 25% in lieu of the listed 75%. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Johnson seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. And let me just make sure that, um, Rachel, were you able to get that motion or do you need anything restated? No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay, um, any further discussion on this item? Seeing none and acknowledging the Commissioner San Sundberg and Bjornberg have recused themselves. Can we call the roll? And you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being blinded at the moment. That's okay. Uh, uh, Commissioner Bjornberg. Abstain. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Commissioner Howard. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom. Aye. Commissioner Sandbolt. Aye. Commissioner Stady. Aye. Commissioner Struthers. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Commissioner Sundberg. Abstain. That's eight yeas and two abstentions. Thank you, that motion passes and I'm gonna pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. You're welcome. Um, that concludes our public hearing items for tonight. Um, do commissioners or staff have any announcements or new commission business to discuss? Andrea, do you have any announcements? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Chair, I just have one announcement just saying that um, this afternoon at the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee, the item that was on the previous HPC agenda, the Como Avenue Church designation, which was denied um, in June, um, was also denied on consent at uh, the Biz Committee hearing. So that will next go to City Council for final, um, I wouldn't say approval, final denial, I guess. Um, but that is the only update I have from Biz Committee and no other updates at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there Commissioner Howard? Okay, I think I got, um, yep, I'm back on off of mute. Okay, <laughs> I just wanted to mention, um, as you know, I, I uh, work with the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions on doing uh, camp and they have a call for session proposals out for their big uh, conference that is every two years. So the conference will be next uh, July in Ohio in Cincinnati um, and it's called Bridging the Divide and they have a call for session proposals out. So I would just encourage um, anyone uh, working in preservation and I would encourage city staff as well to think about uh, whether or not you could uh, uh, present at the, the next forum. It'll be pretty exciting, hoping that we can all get back together again next um, uh, summer. The, this conference is a great way to uh, see what other commissions are doing across the country and to network with our peers. Um, so you don't feel so alone as you go through long discussions like this. Uh, you can maybe learn some tips and, and uh, see what other people are dealing with in other parts of the country. So. That's it for me. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Um, I know we both attended the last uh, NAPC thing, and I really enjoyed a lot of the talks. So I would I would agree if anybody wants to um, put forward something, it, it was really fun to attend it. Um, any other business from commissioners? Okay, I don't see any. With that, we've completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will again ask members and staff if there are any other matters to come before this meeting. 
There being no other business this meeting, if not and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the HPC is July 27th, 2021. Thank you, everyone.